Now, in this scenario, where performance obligation goes beyond a year, the question we ask ourselves is, how do we recognize the revenue? How do we recognize the revenue? So the rules are established in that particular case. We have to look at the criteria for such contracts. What does that mean? It means that a performance obligation is satisfied over a period if one of the following criteria is met. Okay? If one of the following criteria is met. One, the customer simultaneously receives and consumes the benefits provided as they occur. So, for instance, we are, you know, constructing a building. And we'll get into some of these things uh, pretty later. For instance, we are constructing a building or we are constructing a facility. Okay? And maybe it's a story building that we are constructing. So, and it is a five-story or ten-story. So, as we finish with each floor, the customer occupies it. As we finish with each floor, each floor, the customer occupies it. So, if the contract is such that the consumer simultaneously receives the uh, and consume the benefit provided as they occur, then we need to recognize revenue. Two, the entity performance creates or enhances an asset that a customer controls as the asset is created or enhanced. So it means that in the second scenario, the asset is not within our control. We are building, uh, uh, constructing a building or a bridge or something like that, a dam, a ship, or something like that. But then what happens is that the customer is able to have control over that particular asset. If that is the case, then performance obligation goes beyond one accounting year. Three, the entity's performance does not create an asset with an alternative use to the entity, and the entity has an enforcement right to pay for the performance completed to date. So it means that there is a contract to the entities and the obligation to pay us for the things that we have done so far. If any of these scenarios is present, we are going to conclude that the performance obligation may be recognized over a period of time. So example of some of these things could be streaming services over a two-year period, all right? Like, for instance, the software we use to uh, stream or our, do our live streams, it's paid for. And as we are using the software, uh, as they are providing us the software, we are using it. Are you getting it? So that is the first criteria, simultaneous consumption of the benefit by the customer in that regard. Construction of a bridge, a building, a dam, a ship, all of these qualify for performance obligation beyond one accounting year. So generally, that is going to be the criteria that we would have to take into consideration in recognizing it. So let's jump into it and let's be a little bit practical here. And I want you to stay with me pretty carefully as we jump into the discussion here. So this is what is happening here. Generally, let's assume that we are constructing a building. So let's say we're constructing a building. And what do we do? How do we recognize the revenue? How do we measure the revenue? So we are constructing a building, and the building is over five years. Or maybe it's a two year. These days, they don't take a longer time to finish the a building. But we need to measure the revenue. How much revenue do we recognize? This is the rule. Where performance obligation is beyond one accounting year, usually revenue will be recognized based on the percentage of completion. So where performance obligation is beyond one accounting year, revenue is recognized based on 
the percentage of completion. Revenue is recognized based on the percentage of completion. Now, I want you to stay with me very carefully as we dive into the discussion here. So we're going to be recognizing revenue based on how much work has been done so far. How much work has been done so far. Now, note that if we, we are saying that performance obligation is beyond one accounting year, that doesn't mean all contracts will go beyond one accounting year. If the contract is executed in less than one year, that means we will just recognize the total amount as revenue and we go away in that regard. But the issue is that sometimes the period is less than a year, but it's cut across different accounting periods. This is what I mean by that. Let's say, for instance, our year ended is 31st October. And we, sign, we started a project that would take nine months. And we started a project in June 2020. And our year ended is 31st October 2020. So the question is, it's just a nine months project. But we started it in June. So in June to 31st October, how, what is the percentage of work that has, that has been done? It means we will recognize the revenue for that period depending on the percentage of work that has been done. So the work can be done within the same accounting year, within the same reporting year, no problem, we go away, we recognize the revenue. But sometimes it's a shorter period, less than a year, but it cuts across the accounting period. And so we would have to identify the portion that must be recognized in the current period. That is something that you have to be uh, careful about and very mindful of. So if we calculate revenue, or determine revenue or measure revenue or recognize revenue based on the percentage of completion, how do we calculate the percentage of completion generally? There are two methods that can be used for the percentage of completion calculation. Two methods. Two methods. The first one is called the output method. And the second one is called the input method. So we have the output method and the input method. What does that mean? It means that with the output method, we are going to be measuring revenue based on the proportion of work completed for the entity or for the customer generally. So we're going to look at the value of the finished product at the stage that we are at. With the input method, we are going to be valuing the work that we have done so far, percentage of completion so far, based on the input or cost that have been incurred to date. Based on the percentage of input or cost that has been incurred to date. Now, I'm going to come back to the method of uh, percentage of completion, but let's go through the general rule for this. So we're going to go through a couple of steps here on when we are dealing with uh, a construction contract or something like that. Step number one is to calculate the profit or loss on the contract. We calculate the profit or loss on the contract. Now, how do we calculate the profit or loss on the contract? Stay with me carefully here. We're going to have the contract price coming in, which is the same as the contract value coming in. Then we less. I'm going to move with two cash columns here. Stay with me carefully. Then we less cost incurred today you're going to less cost incurred to date and then 
estimated cost to completion. Estimated cost to complete. We add these two up, and that gives us what we call the contract. The total contract cost. So that is going to be subtracted. If we get a positive figure, it means we just made a profit. If we get a negative figure, it means we made a loss. But that is the first step. So for the question that we have at the disposal, usually we would have to determine whether we've made a profit on the contract or we've made a loss on the contract as an entity in that regard. Have we made profit or loss on the contract for the period under review? Now, based on that, we go to step two. And I'm going to divide step two into two categories, so stay with me carefully. So step two, I, where there is loss. Now, if the contract results into a loss, then it should be provided for and recognized as an expense in the P&L account in accordance with IAS 37. So where the contract may result into a loss, it is provided for and recognized in the financial statement. It is provided for and recognized in the financial statements in accordance with IAS 37, that is provisions, contingent liabilities, contingent assets. Why? Because this will be termed as an onerous contract or one Ross contract, depending on the school you attended and the teacher that taught, taught you how to pronounce things. On Ross contracts or one Ross contract for the KG2 people. So on Ross contracts. So in accordance with IAS 37, immediately we calculate and we realize that the contract results into a loss, boom, that loss must be provided for. So the journal entry on that is going to be to debit, profit or loss, because it's an expenses, then we'll credit provisions. And that will go to the statement of financial position. Because when we say credit provisions, that means it is going into the statement of financial position. So immediately, we write it off. We write it off. That is the idea about that. What it means then is that any cost incurred on the contracts to date will be treated as expenses as well okay any cost incurred on the contract to date is treated as expenses shall be recognized as expenses which is obvious generally uh, in that regard for the period under review. It's obvious. And then the amount of revenue recognizable will also be equivalent to the cost that is incurred. Okay? The amount of contract revenue recognizable, the amount of contract revenue the amount of contract revenue to be recognized shall be equivalent to the
total cost incurred to date. That's the idea there. So step one, we do the calculation and we get a loss. That loss is recognized as an onerous contract. And that is in the provisions IAS 37. It's a one-time event resulting into a loss. It's not that every building, every project we undertake results into a loss. If we expect that every project we undertake will result into a loss, that one is operating expenses. And future operating expenses, there is no present obligation. So in accordance with IAS 37, the entity cannot provide for it. In accordance with IAS 37, the entity cannot provide for it. But this is a one-time event occurring, resulting into a loss. That is why we call it onerous contract. And in that case, we provide for it in accordance with IAS 37, provisions, contingent liabilities, and contingent assets. Then... Where it results into a profit, that is the II of step two, the II of step two, where the contract results in profits. So where there is a profit, then revenue and profits to be recognized for the year ended and the review will be based on the percentage of completion. So in this case, the amount of revenue and profit to be recognized and profit to be recognized for the year ended shall be based on the percentage of completion. Sounds good? That is the idea about that. So this is where the calculation of the percentage of completion comes in in step three. So calculation of percentage of completion comes in. So that is why we said that we have the input method. In the imp with the input method, we said the percentage of completion will be equal to the cost incurred to date divided by total contract cost times 100. So our answer will be in X percent. And we'll get into this in a moment for you to see. Our answer will be in X percent. So the amount of revenue to be recognized for the year under review, will depend on the percentage of completion. And so there are two methods to calculate the percentage of completion. The input method, that is the first thing you are seeing here. Then the output method. Now with the output method, what is happening is that the percentage of completion will be equal to the work certified, all right, or invoice amount divided by contract value 
or the contract price times 100. So these are the two methods that can be used in determining our percentage of completion. So it depends on the context of the question and which method may be appropriate. It depends on the context of the question and which method may be appropriate. But usually, that is what we're going to be having, the input method and the output method. Remember, the step two that we are looking at the profits to be recognized in the financial statement based on the percentage of completion is for the statement of financial performance, usually. But then we need to also find out how much must be recognized on the face of the statement of financial position. So that leads us to step four. What will be recognized on the face of the statement of financial position? So on the face of the statement of financial position, what is going to be happening is that we are going to be looking at receivables and contract assets and liabilities. Please stay with me very carefully. So we will have this format coming in. We'll bring in cost incurred to date. That will be brought here. Then we'll bring in the recognized profit or loss generally. Remember, this is coming from step two. You've already done how much profit will be recognized, how much loss should be recognized in that regard. Then, if it is profit, you're going to add. If it is loss, you're going to subtract generally. Then you're going to bring in the work certified or the amount invoiced. That is going to be brought in there for the period under review. Once we get that, the balancing figure gives us a contract asset, if it is positive, or liability, if it happens to be negative. And that will be on the face of the statement of financial position. Now, the reason behind this is that we want to look at how much cost have we incurred as compared to how much is the supply, uh, customer supposed to give us. Because remember, we have worked, but a valuer will come and say, okay, the work you've done so far, the value is $100,000. That is the work certified, and that is the amount we will invoice to the customer. So we've incurred a cost of, say, $150,000. We've recognized a profit on that cost of, say, $10,000, making $160,000. But the uh, uh, surveyor said the value or the uh, valuer said the value of the work we've done so far is just $130,000. That means there is still some money to be received from the customer. That is why it will be called contract asset. But if it happens that we invoice more than how much we have incurred and recognized in terms of profits, then it will be leading to a contract liability. So that is going to be recognized on the face of the statement of financial position. But this is the sweet spot. The invoice we give to the customer, the customer is not going to pay us all the invoice because in each contract, there is going to be what we call retention money. The reason is that the customer will feel that if uh, he gives us all the money for the work we've done so far, quote-unquote, we may leave the contract and go away because we are finding out that maybe the contract is becoming too hard. So in order to prevent the contractor from leaving, the customer is going to retain some amount of money. For that reason, under current assets, we're going to be having issues relating to receivables. 
And that receivables is going to be equal to the amount invoiced to the customer, which is the same as the con work certified, minus the cash received from the customer. That will be receivables on the financial statement. That will be receivables on the financial statement. This is the idea about what we do when performance obligation goes beyond one accounting year. When performance obligation goes beyond one accounting year, these are the steps we go through. Any questions, please? I see some of you guys joining. You are welcome. Give us a thumbs up on the video if you are getting some value already. Remember to subscribe to the channel in case you've not subscribed to the channel. I see some of you guys joining. Emanuele Kubra, Pretty Angel, Kofi Single, Kwame Medical, Herbert J. Franklin, Nyerinda, Carlton, uh, Malone, and then Sameh. Thank you very much for the reactions on Facebook. Really appreciate it. YouTube, give us a thumbs up on the video. Share the video. Let's reach as many students as possible as we continue with this discussion. I see some questions coming, you know, some comments. Let's see if we can take them real quick. If there are any questions, please put it in the chat for me. I would love to hear from you guys. Uh, Bright Nikudu said, uh, please, good afternoon. There is an echo in the sound. I don't know uh, about that. I think it should be good now. Today, I'm in our lecture hall, one of our lecture halls today on campus. So uh, maybe the sound will not be as crispy as it will be if I'm home. Uh, so that's why I'm hearing maybe some echo here. Uh, Stay with a thumbs up there. Thank you. Bernard with a thumbs up. Thank you. EP Basic School Kesiman. Well, what kind of name is that though? Say, so what if the contractor is able to complete the work within nine months? I think I've explained that already. Uh, saying that it is not about when it is necessarily completed, but it's about how much is recognizable in the financial statement. That is what we are really uh, focusing on generally. And I've explained that uh, as well. Ebenezer with an emoji for us there. Okay, let me bring back my screen and let's crunch some numbers. So let's look at our first question. On this one, it's a very simple question that we're going to look at. Uh, let's see. Alex, I think the question is available in the book here. Lavender, okay. So let me take it from here, rather. In our question kits, those of you who are enrolled in our full courses online, you can see the question in your question kit. If you're not enrolled in our full courses, you can take a screenshot. So in your question kit, page 75, you will see Alex, question three. Those of you who are enrolled in our full courses in corporate reporting and financial reporting, in your question kit, page 75, you will find a question. If not to, you can uh, take a screenshot. I'm going to try to arrange the question here. Okay, so this is where we are, and this is what we have. Stay with me carefully. Let's jump into it. The requirement here is pretty simple for us to, you know, recognize, determine the amount to be recognized in the financial statement for the year ended. So the requirement is how the above will be recognized 
will be recognized in their financial statements. for the year ended 31st December 20X5. So stay with me carefully as we try to go through this question quickly for our discussion. So Alex commenced a three-year building contract during the year ended 31st December 20X4. So take notes, the contract started 31st December 20X4. Very important, 31st December 20X4 during that year. And continued the contract during 20X5, which is our year ended or the year ended that we are preparing the financial statement for. So the year ended we are preparing the financial statement for is, you know, 2015. Contract details. Contract value is $45 million. Cost incurred to date at 2015 is $20 million. Estimated cost to completion is $12 million. Work certified as in 20X5 is $15 million. The stage of completion is at 70% as at 20X5. And the profits recognized in 20X5 is 3.3. It's 3.3. So we're going to go through the steps we established earlier here. So step one, we said that we have to determine whether the contract is going to have a profit or not, or a loss, because we have been given the contract value and also the cost incurred by the entity. So let's go. Alex. So we are looking at the workings. So we bring in the total contract value. And our total contract value, we're working in million. Is $45 million. Then we less the contract cost. But that is divided into two. Cost incurred to date at 20X5. That's 20X5. I'm going to push this a little bit further. And that is an amount of $20 million. Then we bring in the estimated cost to completion. And the estimated cost to completion is going to be 12. So we add it up. That is 32. So we less that. And boy, the contract is resulting into a profit. The contract is resulting into a profit. So if we check it up, 32 this, that's going to be around 13. So the contract profit is 13. 13. Now, what did we say? We mentioned that. We mentioned that when there is profit, step two. Step two, where there is profit, revenue and profits to be recognized for the year ended shall be based on the percentage of completion. Now, in the question, the examiner has given us the percentage of completion. So let's go back. We are told that at 2015, they have done 70% of the work. Now, be careful here and stay with me very carefully here. They have done 70% of their work. 70% of their work. 
So if I have done 70% of the work, the question we ask ourselves is, how much do we recognize as revenue? Now, if we go back, the profit is this. So the amount of profit to be recognized, remember, let me also go back. The contract started in 2014 to the year ended 2014. And now we are in 2015. So technically, what is happening is that the contract has been done for two years. Okay? We have done this contract for two years. So if you have done the contract for two years, it means you have to be careful about how much profit to be recognized in the current year and a review. You have to be careful on the amount of profit to be recognized in the current year and a review. So what do we do? Remember 2014, profits recognized is 3.3. So if 2014 profits recognized is 3.3, the question we ask ourselves is, how much profits can be recognized in the current year and a review? How much profits can be recognized in the current year and a review? So let's see. Profits. So we're going to have here the million. We're going to have the revenue coming in. We're going to have the cost of sales coming in. We're going to have the profits coming in. But stay with me carefully. So, contract profit. We have done 70% of the work. So, contract profit is going to be 70% of 13 what do we have? 70% of 13. Let's see. Let me bring up my calculator and punch that out. Um, 0.7 by 13. Let's see what we got. Let's see. 0.7 by 13. That's 9.1. Stay with me very carefully. 9.1. But remember, of this 9.1, last year, we recognized how much? 3.3. .3. So even though at 2015, the total profit that should be recognized is 9.1, we cannot recognize this 9.1 in 2015. So, we have to less the profit that has been recognized previously. So, less profit recognized at 20x4. And the profit recognized at 20x4, we were given in the question to be 3.3. So, we bring it up. So, we less that, then we will now get the profit that will be recognized for the current year. Are you following the picture? So for the current 20x5, the amount of profits recognizable will be our 9.1 already available on my calculator minus 3.3, and that is 5.8. That will be the amount of profit to be recognized. So in the current year, 20x5, our profit statement of profit or loss extract will look like this. So let me put it up. Statement of profit or loss extract. The profit amount is 5.8 here. But the question you ask yourself is, in 2015, how much revenue will you recognize? Note that in the subsequent year, Revenue to be recognized will be equivalent to the work certified. Take that again. In the subsequent year, usually, revenue to be recognized will be based on the work certified for that year. Are you getting it? The work certified for that year. Because if you go and take 70% of 45, which is the revenue, you will be calculating for the total revenue to be recognized. But 
That 70% work is inclusive of last year 20x4 and this year 20x5. So taking 70% of 45 to be the revenue in 20x5 will be wrong. That is why in the 20x5, the amount of revenue recognized will be equivalent to the work certified in that year. Which in our question is 15. So that the balancing figure becomes the cost of sales. So that the balancing figure becomes the cost of sales. So let's punch that out. 5.8 minus 15, and I'm getting 9.2. Any questions? That is the idea about this question. That's what we do. So the amount that will be recognized in the financial statement for the year ended 31st December, 2015, there you have it. That's the answer to the question. That's the answer to the question. Any questions, please? You put it in the chat for me, or you put it in the comment section for me, and I'm going to be providing you with some answers as well there. So these are, or this is how we answer this question. Now let's look at another scenario. And this time around, I'm going to go into the book for us to look at another scenario. This one is going to be a little bit direct. And so um, this one is not in your question kit. This one is in the book, uh, in our financial reporting or corporate reporting book. And in the book, we have like four questions there that you can have access to. So let's see. James Cole. James Cole. Now I'm seeing a comment coming up there. Let's see if I can take it quickly. Um, what do we have? So do you have audits? Sorry, online audits classes? Yes, we have audits. I don't know what kind of audit you're talking about but we have a class for advanced audit and assurance, and it's on Thursdays at uh, 6 p to 9 p.m. Live lectures are on Zoom uh, in that regard, and all our lectures are actually online via Zoom. So if you're talking about advanced audit, then yes. If audit in level two, I'm sorry, we don't do that. James, requirement here is, what is the amount of revenue Recognized in the financial statement of James Cole at 31st December 20X5. And what entries will be made for the contract on the statement of financial position at 31st December 20X5? At 31st December 20X5. So let's see. James Cole entered into a contract to build an office building for a customer commencing on 1st January 20X5. So remember, we are preparing the financial statement for the year ended 31st December 20X5, and we started a contract in 20X5. With an estimated completion date on 31st December 20X6, so it's like a two years project, control of the asset is passed to the customer as construction takes place. And James Cole does not have an alternative use for the asset. Did you hear that? You remember in the introduction, we spoke about the recognition criteria. You remember that? Remember that in the second criteria, we said if one of these events are there, then it means performance obligation goes beyond one accounting year. So the entity's performance creates or enhances an asset that the customer controls as the asset is created. So the question here for James Cole meets that second criteria. Why? Because the customer controls the asset and we don't have any use of the asset. Satisfaction of performance obligation is measured by reference to work completed to date. In the first year to 31st December 20X5, certificates of work completed have been issued to value 750000 Okay. So as of 31st December, the work that the company has done, James Co. has performed, it's valued at $750,000. The 
The final contract price is $1.5 million. Amount invoice to the customer is $625. So even though the work certified is $750, we invoice the customer $625. No payment had been received in respect of the contract. So we've done the work, but no payment has been received. So the examiner is asking us how much revenue will be recognized. Now, in the context of this question, you realize that we are not giving any information about the cost. Okay? So it depends on the context of the question and the way you approach the question. And I don't want you to have a, a one understanding, one approach, and walk with that. No. You must understand the context of the question. So, if you look at it, we don't have any cost information. All we have is work certified, total contract price, amount invoiced. So, the question then is, how much revenue can be recognized? I've already told you. The amount of revenue that will be recognized will be equivalent to the work certified, which is the 750000 So, the general entry to be passed here is going to be pretty simple, generally. We will debit receivables, being the invoice we've sent to the person, customer who has not paid us. We recognize revenue with the, you know, work certified in that regard. Then the balancing figure will be treated as contract asset. Because even though the value of the work we've done is 750000 the invoice we sent to the customer is just 625000 So the balancing figure, 125000 becomes a contract asset an extra amount receivable from the customer. And that is how we account for this transaction. Are you getting it? So that is the idea about that. So in the context of this question we have, this is how we approach it. And there are various aspects. Like I said, it depends always on the context of the question. The context of the question would direct us as to how we are going to be dealing with the issue. That's the idea about that. That's the idea about that. And so that is the issue about what we do as well when performance obligation goes beyond one accounting year. When performance obligation goes beyond one accounting year, this is what we do and how we present it in the books of the entity. And how we present it in the books of the entity. Any questions, please? I see some of you guys joining. This is the IFRS masterclass that we are looking at generally. And uh, we want to conclude on IFRS uh, 15, that is revenue from contract with customers, one of the basic accounting standards. So give us a thumbs up on the video and also subscribe to the channel in case you've not subscribed uh, to the channel. Help to share the video so we can reach as many students as possible as well. So together we can assist a lot of students on the stream. So let me share some final issues with you here on IFRS 15. How do we recognize revenue? Now, there are a number of questions available in the book. How do we recognize revenue when a company sells goods on what we call a sales with right of return basis? In other words, if an entity sells goods to a customer and the customer has the right to return the goods, should the customer not being able to sell the products at the end of the year, how do we account for such transaction? And that is the rule that we have here, exceptionally. The standard states that where products are sold with a right of return, IFRS 15 requires an entity to recognize all of the following. One, we will recognize revenue for the transfer goods in respect of consideration to which the entity expects to be entitled. What does that mean? It means the amount of revenue recognized will be equivalent to the value of the goods that we expect to actually sell. Why? Because the revenue cannot be recognized on the products that we expect to be returned. 
So what does that mean? It means that, for instance, if we sell goods valued at, say, $100,000, and we expect that the customer may return, you know, 20% of that, that means that the amount of revenue we can recognize will be 80% of the $100,000. Because it is the 80% that we have actually transferred to the final consumer. That is what we are trying to say here. Then we have to recognize a refund liability because it's likely that we're going to be refunding the customer should a customer pay us. So there must be a provision for a liability in that regard. So what it means is that the general entry for this 100,000 will be to debit cash with 100,000, right? Then we credit revenue with the 80,000. Then the balancing figure will be provisions for, we credit, the balancing figure, which is 20,000, will be credited to refund liability. It's a provision we are making. Are we following the picture? We'll be treated as refund liability. Now, should a customer not even pay us, we will still debit receivables, no P. We could debit receivables. But the most important thing is that we are recognizing a refund liability. That is the second thing. So number one, we recognize revenue equivalent to the actual amount we expect to receive. Any amount that we expect that a customer will return we will not provide, we will not recognize it as revenue. Instead, we will recognize that as a refund liability. Then an asset will be recognized, that is adjustment to cost of sale for its rights to recover products from customers on settling the refund uh, liability in that regard. So it's likely that we have to recognize the proportion of the revenue uh, of the goods that we've sold to the customer that is likely to be returned. That is likely to be returned by the customer. In the context of my illustration here, that's going to be the 20000 And that 20000 must be adjusted for in the cost of sales and recognized as part of closing inventory for the entity. Recognized as part of closing inventory for the entity. So technically what it means is that we're going to be debiting uh, the inventories in that regard. We're going to debit the inventory in that regard and subtract it from cost of sales since we have not technically sold that particular good. So where an entity sell or make a sales where the customer has a right to return the goods, that is the principle we need to look out for on how it will be accounted for. And generally, these are the ideas about what you need to understand when we talk about IFRS 15 revenue from contracts with customers now like i said we could have a dedicated question on this right in the exam hall so there could be a dedicated question boom or it could be part of the footnotes of the financial statement preparation that we would have to deal with so that is the issue about that any questions for me please any questions uh for me any questions? That's the idea about IFRS 15.